Hello, and welcome to this episode of Physical Attraction. This week, we're going to be talking to Amy Westerbelt, host of the new podcast Drilled, which looks into how fossil fuel companies secretly funded fossil fuel deniers for decades. We had a fascinating conversation about climate change and politics in the United States, her inspirations behind the show, and the true crime aspects of denialism. So without further ado, my interview with Amy Westerbelt. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So the first thing I'd like to ask you about is a little bit of background. Uh, Your journalistic career has this running thread that I thought was very valuable when I looked into it, and something that perhaps scientists don't do enough of or need help achieving, which is relating these big environmental issues, things surrounding sustainability and climate change and so on, to, to people's own lives. And there was a lot of work there about the intersection between health and the environment. So I'd like to ask, first of all, when you sort of became interested in this particular journalistic beat and also about some of the stories that kind of surprised or shocked you to learn about that you think more people should be aware of? Yeah, I actually started looking at um, clean tech and this was in 2000, so quite a long time ago in clean tech years. <laughs> and um, and I was really interested in all of the, the technology side of things. And then I quickly realized that... Um, there were maybe like 12 other people that were interested in the the very specific things that I was interested in <laughs> and that um and that the stories that really got read a lot were the ones that managed to kind of bridge that technology with something that was happening in people's lives so um so that's kind of what led me to doing more stories at that intersection um just speak you know people have a hard time envisioning long-term consequences of things. And if you can tie it to their daily lives, it just makes it a little bit more compelling. Um, but as far as some of the surprising things, I, um, like there are a couple, one is, uh, around air pollution and particulate matter and how particulate matter in particular can feed into obesity and type two diabetes, um, in lots of different types of people, which was interesting and also makes it, you know, on the financial side, helps people um, kind of get behind the idea of um, maybe, you know, losing some profits in this area, but cutting a lot of costs down the road in, in terms of health impacts and things like that. Because in the U.S. in particular, like people really tend to look at regulation um and any kind of policy that tries to limit emissions as a, as some kind of business killer, you know, and, and like the only, the only bottom line we look at is the corporate bottom line. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Meanwhile, all these other costs are being offloaded onto the public. And um, that tends to be like a, a story that makes people go, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, that's not fair. Um, so yeah, my twin, my twin brother is an economist and I'm sure he won't mind me bringing oh. this up, but I remember when he was studying economics at undergraduate about the environment and uh, he said, oh, yes, environmental damage. Well, that's a negative externality. And I said, right. well, what is this? And he said, oh, yes, mm-hmm. that's a cost that's borne by someone else. Yeah, it's, ex- it's all externalities. I know it's crazy. Yeah, yes. exactly. But I think if you have that kind of very free market view of the world that is uh, popular in some corners here and, and in some corners in the US as well, um, mm-hmm. it can be tempting to look at it that way. But actually, if you express that to most people, even if they think of themselves as conservatives, they won't necessarily view it as fair. And environmental right. protection has had a conservative route with uh, the EPA yes. Foundation and things. Yes, totally. Yeah. Um, weird coincidence, I also have a twin brother, although he's not <laughs> a communist. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is probably for the best. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so uh, one other thing I wanted to ask about in terms of the journalism you did before Drilled, which is this podcast mm-hmm. about uh, climate denialism and the invention of climate denialism that we'll get on to talk about in a minute, is um, mm-hmm. the reporting you did surrounding the environmental impacts of Tesla, uh, mm. lithium-ion batteries in general, and the Gigafactory, yeah. this kind of thing. Because I think, yeah. like most people listening to this show, uh, you yeah. know, we, we all love the idea of solar panels, electric cars, a futuristic energy system that won't have all of these fossil fuel disadvantages, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. although maybe not necessarily cults of personality surrounding particular individuals but but the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the issue is uh the environmental and social impacts of industries that have clean goals and motivations uh yes. can can be underestimated so what was it like to cover tesla and what did you find they're very used to like when so <clears throat> i actually started covering tesla a long time ago um when they were you know did not have <laughs> 
a car yet, you know? <laughs> and, <clears throat> and I think that, um, they've kind of, they've always kept a really tight lid on things and they've tried to continue to do that. And I feel like that is kind of at the root of some of the the PR problems that they're having at the moment is that, you know, you get to a certain size and you can't like muzzle everyone. Right. So, um, uh, in, in the case of the Gigafactory, um, they, I had this experience, which I've had with them a few times where, um, you know, they have kind of their, um, story that they want to tell the press and, um, they'll, they just kind of like, will keep repeating that. Even if you ask quite, like, if you ask questions, they're sort of like, Oh, that's not relevant. You know? Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. so with the batteries, yeah. With the batteries, I asked if they, if they, if the batteries include any heavy metals, which obviously I know they do. And, but I wanted to like, you know, I wanted them to explain it because they sent out a press release saying that the batteries don't contain any toxic materials or heavy metals. Um, I was like, what lithi lithium? Uh, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah i was like but, like anyone with like a basic science degree would know that's not true you know um and i mean they include i think they yeah they include cobalt too so i was just like i mean come on um and and i think what they're trying to do is amazing and it would be fantastic to um to get more of a, an electric fleet on the on the road and all of that stuff but um, I don't think that you need to, to, um, overstate things to do that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so you don't need to be deceptive. Right. Exactly. It's like, if you do that, then all of a sudden it becomes now, like right now, I feel like everyone is focused on all of like catching them in lies, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to, um, all of the good stuff that, that has happened. And, you know, it's like all these stories coming out of mistreatment of factory workers and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you know, um, you still have to behave like a responsible company. Like you don't get a pass just because you're doing a generally like socially responsible business, you know? Um, yes. but anyway, yeah, they, they also said that, um, they were going that they had a closed loop recycling process for batteries, which again, I was like, come on, no one has managed to do that unless you guys have a major breakthrough that you haven't talked about, which isn't like you. Um, like, mm -hmm. That's just not true. Um, so when you say and, a closed loop recycling process, they were claiming to completely recycle batteries without yes. leaving waste. And like a complete capture of all lithium in the batteries that was then repurposed into new batteries, which is just not happening. Okay. Um, because it's not technically, well, it's actually not financially um, viable right now because there's so, there's actually like so little lithium in the batteries that it's not yet worth it to try to, you know, recover all that. They are, but the thing is like that overshadows all of the actual stuff that they're doing, you know, where they are recycling a lot of the, the plastic casings of the batteries, a lot of the um, more basic metals in the batteries those are all being recycled, not necessarily into new batteries, but into, you know, other parts and things like that, which is cool and would be a good enough story to tell, you know? Um, so I think, I, I don't know, to me, that's kind of like always the story of Tesla is like, um, they are Cutting never like hyperbole, maybe. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, the actual story is great i don't really understand the need to to like fluff it up you know <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely you know I'd, I'd heard about a lot of the things uh, involving the concern over factory workers unionizing but i wasn't aware that even though it's a green company they also sort of greenwash themselves a little bit yeah which is so weird to me i'm like why would you i'm it's just unnecessary you know you're already doing actually a much better job than most car companies on that front. There's no need to um, exaggerate beyond the the reality. Um, but again, I think that comes back to a little bit of like um, ego and hero worship and all that stuff. <laughs> you know, yeah. he is one of those figures who it is incredibly difficult to criticize because an army of people jumps on you immediately oh, whenever you I do know. it. Yeah, I had a. Um, I had a little like Twitter spat with him because I pointed out that um, that on the first media tour that they did at the Gigafactory, <clears throat> they had a bunch of journalists come in and then they immediately made everyone sign NDAs, which I was like, but we're media. Um, mm. you know? Yeah. So <laughs> um, we're not like, going to disclose job. what we find out. That's <laughs> why we're here. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, just don't have a media tour then, you know. Um, yes, a factory tour on deep background. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, it was interesting. And then it was sort of like it had, you, 
the factory had been like very, very like cleaned up and you were only allowed to see certain areas. It was just very like, just, you know, this attempt to control the narrative, which is very in line with um, how Elon Musk has always been. But it's like, if you get, again, like once you get to a certain size, you have to kind of be willing to let a little bit of that go. Um, but I also think part of it is that um, he comes from a tech background and the way that, that um, the U S media in particular works with tech is it's very, um, it's very much access journalism in the same mm -hmm. way that politics is, you know, it's very like you get, you get the stories if you're giving positive coverage, you know? And so, um, so they kind of have this idea that that's how it should be. Um, and then they get really mad when, anyone says anything that's not, you know, how amazing, look at what they're doing. What a cool car, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, when you talked about going to the factory that had been specially prepared and cleaned up for you, obviously that is what any sort of company would do, but it did make right. me think a little bit about uh, Theranos and the bad blood <clears throat> yes. uh, story and some of the reporting that came up there. And I think there is this Silicon Valley, perhaps uh, secrecy. I mean, I'm not saying that the companies are comparable in any way, but Right, Theranos right. also hid behind uh, their socially uh, beneficial mission and yes. uh, high-tech veneer. And then underneath, in, in that case, there was a lot of stuff that was patent fraud. Now, obviously, there's mm -hmm. not necessarily that behind Tesla, but you right, know, th right. there can still be things that aren't as perfect as they would say, and they sort of conceal yeah. it in the same way. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, you know, the other thing that happens with Silicon Valley tech, and I think it ha happened with both of those companies um, is that there is very much this obsession with um, um, disruption and like, we're going to disrupt this industry. And, and, um, and the tendency there then is to uh, throw out anything that that industry has ever done. Right. And so in the case of automotive, there are a lot of advancements that have been made and a lot of ideas that have been like tested and failed and thrown out that Tesla is like, not like, um, stubbornly not learning from, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, like the quality controls that are in place for, um, for car companies are there for a reason, you know, um, it's not because they're like dinosaur companies that are too, um, top heavy and slow and what, you know what I mean? It's like, um, I think they're going to butt up against some, some things that, um, that maybe they haven't, anticipated i also i'm <clears throat> i'm married to an automotive engineer and I so I'm, I'm constantly getting an earful of like oh they really haven't thought about this this and this you know? <laughs> right. right yes because they didn't start out as a car company right exactly they started out as a tech company and and that's like been part of the benefit to them right but it, it but i think like completely dismissing everything that the automotive industry has done is probably a mistake Mm. It will be interesting um, to see in the long run if the car companies, the traditional car companies that are now coming out with electric vehicles to rival, te yeah. rival Tesla will actually, because they have, I guess, a cash flow from their original cars and also yeah. more experience well, in specifically and, car design. Exactly. And also they don't release things until they're absolutely certain that they are able to scale mm. and that they're able to deliver on time and on quality and all of those things. Right. Which like Tesla is the, you know, the Apple of cars, right. Mm -hmm, <laughs> like, let's mm -hmm. just put it out there. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know. I, like as soon as I started seeing, you know, the, like the BMWs of the world kind of starting to, to really release some serious car programs around this stuff. I was like, mm, we'll see how Tesla, um, you know, manages with that. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I mean, it leaves uh, us all in a very interesting position because obviously we're all very much in favor of, uh, solutions yeah. to climate change and anything that can help. And so yeah. it's great to see innovation and a focus yes. on if you take the IPCC seriously, if you take the people who are talking about climate change seriously, we need radical transformations in the world. We can't have yes. fossil fuel cars on the roads after 2040, 2050, if we want to stick to the Paris mm -hmm. Agreement. So mm -hmm. we do need these transformations, but also that shouldn't mean that the people who are driving them should be immune from criticism about other things. Right. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'd also like to ask about podcasting. Um, because oh, yeah. for me, I think one of the great advantages of this medium and why I'm very happy that it's become uh, extremely popular now is that you can <laughs> build what feels like a more personal connection between the audience and the host. Mm -hmm. you, know, you hear someone's voice. That's quite a personal thing. You hear them week in and week out. 
And back when I was just a fan of podcasting and not trying to do it myself, um, that <laughs> feeling of familiarity was one of the things that I really enjoyed. And uh, when I started out, I wanted to emulate those podcasters that I had admired and kind of built up a sense of connection to. So you host the podcast, Tell Me About Your Mother, mm-hmm. and also Drilled, which we'll come on to yep. in a second. And you've set mm-hmm. up the Critical Frequency Podcast Network before. So what's your take on podcasting? What do you think are the advantages of telling stories in this way? And do you have any podcasting inspirations? Yeah, I, I mean, I love it. I, I, um, I started out in um, print journalism, and then maybe six or so years ago, I was listening to the the news radio, and um, which here is NPR, and I was, um, I was like, oh man, I wish I could do that. And then I was like, well, I could, I could just, you know, there's a lot of like local stations and things, mm-hmm. so I called up my local station and sort of asked if I could be an intern for a while and they looked at my resume and they were like um you have like a more reporting experience than anyone we have on staff <laughs> sure <laughs> so I went in and I did an internship for about a month to sort of you know learn how to use all the audio equipment and then um, started working there as like a local reporter which was really interesting because I had never done sort of community reporting and it was in Reno, Nevada, which is a very weird place. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> What's it like? My like one sentence um, on Reno is that you can walk down the street with a gun, um, a beer, a joint and a prostitute and it's all legal. <laughs> wow. That's certainly not true anywhere in England. <laughs> it's very it sounds, wild. It sounds attractive like, to some people. <laughs> I, I feel like, I feel like the Nevada state motto is like, we're Nevada, leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly seems like there'd be some interesting stories to report out of there. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So I, I started reporting and I um I loved it and there were so many good stories, but then I realized that, you know, when you're doing news reporting, you get hours and hours and hours of tape and then it gets whittled down to like four minutes that are just the facts and like none almost none of the story. And so um I started a podcast with a colleague there. Um called range where we told these like crazy stories of the the American West. And then after that, I had this idea for tell me about your mother. And I started that. And then I, I kind of like developed just sort of a podcast habit. And that is actually one of my favorite things about it is that as long as you have sort of the basic skills to do it, you can kind of like test out any idea you have. Um, and, and it's, I, I see it kind of similar to, um, long form print journalism that like you can tell these longer stories and like more narrative pieces in audio, um, in ways that just convey something different. Like even, you know, drilled is actually a really good example of that. Like the, um, you know, the inside climate news reporting team did an amazing job, um, with a, a, a print series a couple years ago, looking at a lot of these Exxon memos in particular, and they really, they really zeroed in on specifically Exxon. Um, And then there's been some reporting on Shell as well. And the LA Times ran some stuff and it's all great. But I think um, hearing the actual um, scientists' voices um, is just like a a layer of, um, I don't know, there's just like a a layer there that makes it sort of sink in more, (laughs) you know, and like, and being able to sort of like, bring it all together in one cohesive narrative versus like kind of forcing people to go and read 10 different stories or whatever to get the the whole picture, um, I think is something that only audio can really do. Um, and then, you know, it's a lot cheaper than making a documentary film. So <laughs> it's mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And then and, as far and also as the- documentaries where it's just footage of people sitting and talking. Yes. If, if you don't necessarily have that many visual uh, visuals that you can use. I don't think it's always the best format to show things in. No, I don't either. I don't either. Um, and you know, the cool thing with audio too, is that you can use sound design to like convey a point too. you know, like if you have a good composer, there are a couple of, of sound designers in particular that I'm like, I'm amazed by. Um, there's a woman named Caitlin Prest, who's from, um, she's from Canada, but I'm not quite sure where, uh, but she had a podcast called The Heart for a long time, and then she just released something with the um, the CBC called Stran- Strangers Shadows, something like that. Anyway, she's mm-hmm. amazing. Like her um, ability to sort of like layer different sounds to create just kind of this whole other universe is really 
I don't know. It's impressive. And then I also think that the, um, the sound designers on snap judgment are amazing. They, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, because I don't have like highly technical audio skills, I'm always amazed at, at those shows, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And certainly the, the times I've tried to do stuff like that myself, I've realized how much of an art it is and how difficult Hard. it can be to yeah. create an atmosphere without distracting from the content of what you're saying. And yes. those, those people who do it well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the bassist in a rock band. You don't notice yeah. that it's there. But then if it was taken out, you'd realize that you've lost an awful lot all of a sudden. Yes. So let's move on to Drilled and talk about Drilled okay. then. So I really like uh, the phrasing of this as a true crime drama, because mm -hmm. we know that true crime is popular. And I think a big part of the reason for that is that people like these narratives that involve individuals, um, yes. their personal stories, their motivations, mm -hmm. um, and anything with a sort of hint of scandal. It strikes me as ironic that climate scientists and advocates have to deal with these endless conspiracy theorists saying, oh, global warming is a conspiracy, it's a hoax made right. up by China or by scientists who want to get paid more, as if uh -huh. as if you actually get that much for being a research <laughs> scientist. That one always kills me. I'm like, right, scientists are just like raking it in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm just here like, yeah, I get a stipend that's enough to live on. But if I went and worked for an oil company, I would earn three or four times more. But that's not okay, no. but, but there was, it, it's so ironic when there was in fact a real conspiracy to Yes. suppress this information from the public yeah for I mean, a very a clear profit they, motive. They like, yeah that's a classic move they are are like the kings of accusing mm. their opponent of the very thing that they're doing <laughs> like, mm. um it's a it's like a tried and true tactic of the um the like the fossil fuel industry but it's but like the sort of um very far right conservatives in the u.s in general they've been sort of doing that forever even like actually the media the the stuff that they accuse the media of too is um kind of in the same camp where they they um they have been accusing like the mainstream media of having a liberal bias for years and in fact um as they've been accusing so like they've sort of used that to build up a, a whole conservative media that is extremely biased. And then these accusations of bias have actually like helped to make the media more conservative because <laughs> journalists are like, well, I don't want to appear biased. And so they overcorrect the opposite direction. Um, and there's data that shows like that actually the, the entire media has shifted um, towards the, the right. And I, it's mostly linked to this whole, you know, them kind of making accusations that aren't true and then, you know, people reacting to them. It's it's wild. Mm -hmm. it, it interests me. There was uh, I did a series of shows that will be coming out eventually on my other show, which is a history show about the so, Louisiana senator Huey Long. He was sort of I guess you would call him a left wing populist. Uh, mm -hmm. in the sort of 1930s and 20s. But his strategy as a politician, as a very controversial politician, was to always attack and accuse the opposition of anything. If they accuse you of a crime, you accuse them of 10. If they accuse you of <laughs> constitutional violation, you accuse them of, of 15 or whatever. And right. as a result, the debate is always being phrased on your terms because your opponent is always defending themselves against your most recent uh, yeah. outrage. <laughs> And yes, they never get a chance to, uh, well, criticize you in any way. Right. Um, and right. it's interesting that we talked about as well, because so in some of the episodes of Drilled that have come out already, and obviously everyone who's listening to this would enjoy this show as well, there is this talk about the manipulation of the media by fossil fuel companies. And mm -hmm. they it's almost like they uh, found these cognitive exploits for people. They sort of understood... The yes. psychology of the individuals so i mean mm -hmm. would, would you like to talk a little bit about how they they did i feel like they they really found these sort of um i hesitate to call them weaknesses because they're not inherently weaknesses but they found these sort of areas to exploit in both journalists and scientists where um with journalists i think you know the accusation of bias and also you know um, a lot of the people that were covering climate weren't necessarily experts on the science. So it was very easy to be like, oh, like you don't even, you don't even understand the science. You have to talk to like this other scientist who, you know, was often like heavily credentialed too. It's like they found people who, you know, had the appearance of legitimate scientists to be these sort of contrarian um, sources. And so they would, 
you know, accuse a journalist of not talking to, um, you know, both sides and not understanding the science and all these kinds of things. And then you see this, this complete false equivalence between like, you know, 97% of scientists over here and then like 3% of scientists <laughs> over here getting equal, um, you know, equal credit and equal play in the, in the media. And then on the, on the scientist side, I think there are a couple things, you know, um, for a long time, like every scientist I talked to is telling me that, um, you know, this is starting to change a little bit, but for a long time, if you were good at communicating science, the sort of, um, notion was that you must either be not focused on your science or not a serious scientist or, or things like that. So, you know, scientists were not only, you know, potentially not great at communicating in general, but like actually dis dissuaded from becoming good at communicating, you know, so that's not helpful when like a big part of the problem is informing the public. Right. Um, and then, and then the other thing is like, I think a lot of people, including journalists who were covering science, just don't understand how, science works, you know, um, that like, that there are these sort of rules to how research is done and that, you know, things need to be um, predictable and repeatable and all of these kinds of things. And that scientists aren't, um, are just not fond of claiming a hundred percent certainty on anything, you know, <laughs> cause like, that's the whole idea, right? That like, there could always be new evidence and there could always be new research or whatever. Um, but at the same time, that that doesn't mean that the um, sort of uh, provable theory to date is is inherently flawed or uncertain or whatever. You know, like, in fact, it's quite the opposite. If, if like, a, there's been a consensus in science, that usually means that it's pretty airtight. It's just that they always leave the window open. You know, um, oil companies knew this very well because they employed a lot of scientists. Um, and they also knew that, like, no one else really knew it. <laughs> so... So they sort of you, like kind of zeroed in on like we can always say like even in a lot of their internal documents will say that like we will never not be able to say that there's uncertainty, you know, um, and we can always kind of like hang our hats on that because that's, you know, because that's how science works. and Nobody else knows it. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of weird to to me how like actually like their actions have catalyzed several climate scientists into becoming better communicators and more like, um, you know, feeling like they actually have to advocate for the science, which I don't think has happened in many other fields. No, it's interesting. And I, I definitely think that is the case that it has been in part a reaction to uh, denialism and having to refute the same few arguments about it. Oh, it's cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the sun. Oh, it's clouds <laughs> over and over again. Okay, but, yeah. yeah, volcanoes. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I still hear all of these arguments, despite the many years okay. of work that's gone into refuting them. I'm sure you do as well. But uh, I mean, oil companies' own scientists refuted these theories yes. in the 80s. You know, like it's just it's and and like it's like they, their own scientists refuted them, and then they went on to pay scientists to continue to promote those theories anyway. You know, um, so it's really like egregious on this issue of uh, balance in the media i thought i don't know whether this story made it over to the u.s but there was a very interesting controversy here in the uk because we have the bbc which is funded right. by license fee payers who are essentially taxpayers uh mm -hmm. from the broadcasting corporation and they had a policy for many years of whenever there was a climate debate they would have a scientist on one side and a chap who was usually a politician from a right-wing think tank on the other side uh -huh. And, you know, yeah. the, the, the debate, which was supposed to be about, I mean, in my mind, the debate over whether climate science is right has been solved right. for a very, very long time. It's a debate about what you do. And I think there is a very valid debate to be had about the best actions to uh, combat climate change or deal with the effects, you know, how much you mitigate, how much you adapt, how, mm -hmm. uh, to what extent, you know, what are the best policy instruments. But the BBC still had this issue where they would have they would think, oh, climate science. Well, obviously, the way to get both sides of the debate here is to have one person mm -hmm. who believes in it and one person who doesn't, right. which is, is misguided. And recently, they circulated this internal piece of advice that said, we're no longer defining balanced in this way. 
Uh, yeah. You know, that that was their guidance to journalists on how to deal with climate change within the organisation was that balance was not going to be one person who is part of the 97% of people who believe in it and one right. person who is part of the tiny minority who don't because believe in it. incredibly imbalanced. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way as you wouldn't, you know, have a debate on, oh, I don't know. I think also the framing of it is important as well. Like, um... The, one of the most popular Facebook groups for discussing climate change that I joined a few of in, in era has as its mm-hmm. uh, uh, its strapline uh, climate change uh, threat to humanity or communist plot. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing the thing I loved about that is imagine if imagine if you were up a, if I was at a debate or something and someone introduced me ah oh, yes uh, Thomas Hornigold is he a student or the murderer of millions it's like well now yeah. that you've made that accusation it sort of sounds a lot worse for me <laughs> than it would have done otherwise. Yes. But uh, yes. I'm hoping that this false sense of balance is is maybe starting to uh, to change, but it, it's it's hard to say that it is. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I think sadly one of the things that breaks through all of the noise is um, natural disasters, and they're not getting any smaller or less frequent. So I think that that is at least here that people are, you know, I, I live in California, half of the state is on fire right now. Um, I think we're, we're getting close to a hundred dead. Um, there are over a thousand people who are missing and unaccounted for entire towns have burned down. Um, and, and so I think people are, you know, when those kinds of things happen and you hear firemen who are, um, tend to be much more conservative in their politics in general, saying these conditions are different. These are not the conditions that we were fighting 10 years ago. You know, it doesn't cool down at night anymore. That's the big one with the fires is that, you know, you see um, nights are warming faster than days. And on top of the fact that they're warmer, they're also less humid. So this period of time when firefighters used to be able to really get on top of a fire is gone. And I think, you know, you hear the Cal Fire Chief saying, you know, a 100,000 acre fire used to be a really rare occurrence. Now we're getting them every year. That kind of stuff, I think, does start to to sink into people. Um, and but there is, you know, there's still a lot of this kind of cognitive dissonance where um, I think one of the things that these campaigns have done so effectively is really make you know, not air quotes, believing in climate change, um, part of the conservative identity. And like, that makes it hard for people to, um, to sort of move past, you know, they're they're sort of like, do I, do I self-select out of my tribe and, you know, start to like care about and do something about this thing or, and also in doing so come to grips with the fact that like, we are in a very, um, precarious, scary time? Or do I continue to um, go with what all my friends and family say and bury my head in the sand and, and like, f- feel like everything's going to be fine, which is appealing, you know? <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tough one. I talked, I did, I talked to a, um, a climate psychologist too, um, during the reporting on drilled. And I didn't end up including her stuff because I couldn't figure out where it fit, but I think I'll probably do something with her in the the year ahead. And she was talking about how it's similar to any type of trauma that like you have to, um, acknowledge it and acknowledge how people might feel about it and how like terrifying it is in order to kind of get people to the place where they can like actually do things. Um, and I, I don't know. I think that's inter- an interesting component of all the, the kind of climate action stuff. Yes, because I think this is a very interesting area that, that we suffer from as scientists, not necessarily knowing the best ways to communicate, uh, not just the results of the science with people, but also how they should react to it. And we see it even now in the framing around this latest IPCC report and all through climate Twitter, all through all of the sort of internal discussions is people saying, how should we express this to people? Do we try and use a deadline and say there's 12 years to take action? Or do we try and uh, focus on things that people can do in their own personal lives? Or do we try and focus on political change? But then we have to resist this accusation of being uh, political actors. You know, (laughs) there's a very, there's a very complex set of issues to deal with that 
personally, as someone who did a degree in physics, I don't feel that uh, it, this is yeah. enough to be a climate scientist to actually solve perhaps probably what is the most difficult problem, which is yeah. catalyzing that social change. So in, in talking to climate psychologists and people like that, what sort of uh, insights do you think uh, that sort of psychological approach, I guess, to, to the issue of climate change is, is coming up with? Yeah, I mean, um, what I hear from a lot of those folks, well, first of all, there's kind of an interesting rift between the, um, like the psychoanalysis camp and the behavioral psychology folks um, and sociologists who, um, yeah, so the psychoanalysts think that like the behaviorists are trying to like put behavior first in a way that like doesn't account for how human psychology works and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, one of the things that I've heard from, from a few of them is that, um, you know, in a lot of cases, people are blocked by a couple of things. Like one is that, <clears throat> you know, like they view climate change, the psychologists view climate change as, as like a trauma. Um, and there's sort of like, you know, in any kind of traumatic experience and, and if you're dealing with any kind of very complex, difficult problem, um, you have to acknowledge that it's hard, you know, and like, you have to acknowledge that it's really sad and scary and all of these things. And, um, kind of like, start there. And then, then you're able to sort of process those emotions and get to action. And so their, their kind of thinking is that a lot of people are sort of, um, stuck in like they, if you can't even acknowledge that it's happening, then you can't acknowledge that it's sad or scary or any of these things. And so like no, nothing is getting sort of processed. Um, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the sort of block to acknowledging that is, is this whole identity piece. You know, it's that I think it's hard for people to um, exile themselves from a group. And that's kind of what we're asking a lot of conservatives to do, you know, is to, is to, um, to say something that in certain circles is considered really not just controversial, but actually like, it's like, who are you? Some lefty liberal hippie now, you know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, I'm not sure how we get past that, except, you know, I do, I do think that, um, that, um, like the one piece of, inf like, I, I think that, you know, for a long time, we focused on giving the public information, right. And that's not, that's not actually like what makes people act. Um, I mean, important for people to have information, but it tends not to be a, a driver of action. Um, but I do think that giving people the information about how climate change denial was totally manufactured um, could be helpful in getting a little bit of movement there. Like, I think if people realize that this idea was planted in their heads very purposely, you know, <laughs> that, that, um, maybe that could move the needle. I'm not sure. But then again, it's like, um, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine that people who have that, who have that kind of mindset will believe that that was done. Even with like the documents that are clearly from, you know, Exxon executives in, you know, between each other or Exxon scientists or whatever. Um, I don't know, like I've had people, especially, and, and again, I feel like this was done deliberately. Like what, you know, if you want to be able to get away with a lot of things, it's really great to have a whole public that doesn't know what facts are or how to check. <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness. Yes. Well, there was that Hannah Arendt yeah. quote about how the ideal totalitarian citizen is not a dedicated yes. fascist or a dedicated communist. Instead, they are someone who no longer believes in the truth almost. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, I think, where we are. Um, I think that's part of why you're seeing a lot of the, you know, reemergence of authoritarianism. And I think that that was done deliberately because it is um, uh, kind of a, a better world for um, for companies that want to make money. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. No one no one knows what the facts are. So let's just stick with the status quo, which is the one where we can exploit people to our yes. heart's content. I mean, I think it's interesting. You talk about this uh, idea of. Uh, communicating climate denialism to people and I think and you know we've already mentioned that this is the real conspiracy to, so to speak and I think it's right. interesting because 
a lot of people who are climate skeptics or uh, climate deniers they engage on an emotional level by trying to say you know you're mistrustful and suspicious of government well this is their latest way of manipulating you into doing x y and z and yeah. you know that is a more effective argument for them than citing the science the science yeah. it, such as it is uh, discredited etc is is there as a veneer for their yeah. underlying argument which is an emotional argument which says mm -hmm. you know these people you dislike and distrust are trying to manipulate you and, yes, and they're trying to take your way of life. That's a big one, too, yes. is like, they want you to have a less comfortable life. And I think yeah. it's, it's interesting to, to what extent we focus on the fact that <laughs> climate science is correct and the informational fact-based arguments that people want to use because, you know, that is the nature of the problem. It's right. it's almost as if saying, you know, if, if you're 50,000 dollars in debt and need to pay off the money then that is the most pertinent fact to your situation it's not any emotional argument about whether your uh bank or whoever are immoral or not but uh right but but it's also this um perhaps it's less effective because yeah. if we're living in an era when emotions do trump facts more often than not it's it's difficult to know where to strike the balance i guess between both sets of argument and i think we yeah. talked also about these cognitive exploits like exploiting the media's fear of yeah. appearing biased exploiting mm -hmm. the scientists and their fear of uh, expressing certainty because mm -hmm. scientists always write for an audience of other scientists who are trying to destroy them and tear their opinions apart and that's <laughs> kind of how the whole process works so they're never right. going to say i'm certain about anything uh, but there's also this cognitive exploit that fossil fuel companies and you describe in Drilled have have exploited in individuals where yes. they've almost tried to focus it as a collective action problem where we should act first. I mean, uh -huh. what, what, do you, what do you think about that and uh, how yeah. that came about as a strategy and how it's been deployed? Well, they, I mean, they literally like did market research and like focus groups to figure out what types of people would be most open to this conspiracy theory idea of theirs. And, um, and then they like went after those people and really kind of like created an army of surrogates for this message. Um, I mean, in a, in a, in a very like cynical way, it's, it's masterful, like their ability to, um, to completely shift public opinion, um, is, is really it's impressive you know <laughs> like it's pro they're probably like the most brilliant public relations minds of this century and actually i will tell you too that i found so i found this very obscure um pr history archive at like a tiny college in new york and they had all these videos of different people who had like started the public relations industry and one of them was um daniel edelman who started edelman pr which was like the big pr firm for um, the American Petroleum Institute and all, all kinds of other things. And um, one of the things that he said in one of these videos was that he had been trained in psychological warfare during World War II. And it just totally stuck with me as like, I'm like, that's what they did. Like, they, <laughs> those were the tactics that were used to, you know, um, it's like, okay, find the people who are like open to their, your message. And they tested it with a lot of different types of people too, to find like, okay, these are the ones that we're going to focus on. And then, okay, well, where do those people hang out and where do they get their information? Okay. We're going to put information there and we're going to really like rile them up. And, and I mean, they did, they shifted, I think in 1991, we found we like there's a document about one of these social influence campaigns that from 1991 and their data said that about 80 percent of of americans um had like knew about climate change and um you know quote unquote believed in it and slightly less than 80 percent like thought there should be some sort of action on it and about half believed there should be action irrespective of cost um and that crossed party lines. These were not people who self-identified as green consumers or anything like that. 30 years later, more than half of the U.S. public believes that climate change has been exaggerated. To, to move the needle that much in 30 years is, is remarkable. And unfortunately, those were 30 really important years. It's not like, you know, if, the, if it had been like 
1930 to 1960 like, it would, kind of would have been okay you know um, yes. and i think this is one of the things that really comes across in in drilled is the fact that actually the fossil fuel companies did pivot there was a point where they were taking this seriously and they weren't mm -hmm. they were viewing it as a scientific problem to investigate and yeah because and if you... I, really, I mean i think so that's something that i think has been a little bit exaggerated actually like there's i think there's a i think what they actually were doing was investing in the science because they thought that that would buy them a seat at the the table when regulations started to be discussed um there were some people in these companies that did really want to push towards being energy companies and pursuing renewable energy and all those kinds of things. And that, you know, that there were probably, I mean, these are huge organizations. So there were probably groups of people who had different ideologies, right? But, um, but I think that there was a certain point where, you know, one went out over the other and, and it became, well, actually the best way to, um, to minimize the impact of regulation is not to be a part of it, but to stop it altogether. I think that was actually like the shift that they made because uh, like the more I've kind of dug and dug and dug into it, it's like, well, yes, the scientists definitely wanted to be doing something, but I don't know that the executives were ever like thinking in those terms because they're pretty hardcore capitalists. you know. <laughs> and, um, and I think, I mean, I think perhaps they thought, well, this is a good way to hedge our bets on the energy front, you know, for sure. Um, but then, yeah, it almost, I don't know, there's a weird sort of ideological thing that happened where they, um, yeah, they kind of were like, well, actually the way, you know, to deal with this regulatory thing is to just totally shut it down. And then for some reason, like the thing that I still don't understand is, why they wouldn't have just kept like solar programs and whatnot going, even if, even at like a much smaller scale for, for purely business objectives. Mm -hmm. um, because if you are a chief executive of one of these fossil fuel companies, there is of course yeah. an economic argument, even if you're a pure economist who views any damage to the, the environment and anyone else as a negative externality that you don't have to worry <laughs> about, you can still, yeah. you can plan in terms of risk and say, oh, well, maybe there's a 10% chance that these changes would be catastrophic and then there would be a very high chance of us being regulated out of existence or taken right. over or forced to stop our activities. So of course it makes sense to try and diversify because our, our right. primary industry may no longer exist that's that's a yes. business decision that has very yes. little to do with political ideology so i see what you're saying that there's this there's this confusion about why it was that they never uh seemed to take it seriously after that whether they were maybe caught up in their own denials of this as a problem I think they were it's really funny again it's this whole like accusing other people of what you yourself are guilty of thing because i actually think like that for all of their bluster about like, oh, you know, you're, you're trying to push your ideology onto, you know, politics or business or whatever. I actually think that that's what they ended up doing because you have these people who like, there's a certain, there's a certain group of these, um, these folks who all had a, a, like a significant amount of power in the fossil fuel industry at, at different times who really like have a, a, um, they're kind of zealots about the idea of like, you know, only fossil fuels, you know, <laughs> and, and they have, there's even like a religious component to it of like, you know, God has given us these fuels and it's like our, I don't know, like religious duty to burn them. Um, it's very, this, this is absolutely <laughs> fascinating to, to sort of secular yeah. people in, in Europe that there's almost like a, a manifest destiny around fossil fuels. There it's, is. It's something that, I, is. I, that we just can't get our head around. Yeah. And that is definitely because even with like, like, um, like the Koch brothers, right, have funded just an enormous amount of um, attempts to block renewable energy incentives, uh, regulation, all this stuff. Right. And there again, it's like they're libertarians supposedly, um, who like don't believe in, in government intervention or in market intervention in general. Right. But yet are trying to dictate the choices that people even have in that market. Um, you know, and I don't know there again, I'm like, I thought it's, so it's this weird thing of like, you know, on the one hand, oh, they just care about money. But actually, if all they cared about was money, then they would have continued to invest in renewable energy. You know? So yes. 
Um, I mean, when we look at the developments in renewable energy that were being made as a result of the oil embargoes in the 70s yeah. and 80s, if they'd kept yeah. on at that level of investment, we would yeah. have the solar boom and it would be run by Exxon and Shell and people like that. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, rather than needing an, an Elon Musk or someone else to come in and try and, you know, take the, the business model that yeah. they stumbled upon 50 years ago. But... I mean, same with the battery things. Like, I yeah. um, oh, you'll hear it today. Actually, and t- today's the last episode. Um, that one of the the former um, Exxon consultants um, was saying, you know, Exxon could have been the ones building the Gigafactory in Nevada. Like, they were working on that technology in the early in the seventies. You know, um, <laughs> you know. So it is. It's like they could have been that. Um, I think that that is part of what makes it that much more um, sort of frustrating slash depressing is that like it could have been so dramatically different and you can hope that maybe one day we'll look back on these things as not only sort of terrible moral and environmental decisions but also bad business moves as well yes Yes. yeah i mean that's that's what we can hope for i guess so moving into the weeds of drilled and the making of it i mean Mm -hmm. i think this there's been some amazing research done recently into the extent to which the fossil fuel companies knew about climate change a long time ago. They had the initial climate models. They had worked out what some of the consequences would be. They they started making business plans uh, for things like drilling in the Arctic and so on that you wouldn't even think right. about if you didn't anticipate changes coming. While mm-hmm. doing all this in private, while keeping that information quiet. Um, mm-hmm. But telling the story in a coherent way has been i think difficult because there's lots of different pieces there's lots of different companies yeah. who knew different things at different times and of course they mm-hmm. are all extremely secretive and everything we get mm-hmm. comes out through FOIA or is leaked and things like right. this so it's it's hard to mm-hmm. build up a coherent story so but would you like to tell us about some of the people that you spoke to and some of the things that fit into the story for you know these missing yeah. pieces that are coming into it yeah yeah so i um I had been I had been trying to find a climate story to do um, audio like an audio story on for years, and I was sitting in um, a courtroom in San Francisco with, that was presided over by Judge Alsop, who was the judge in one of these climate liability cases, and he had mandated um, a climate science tutorial, and um, you know like half the courtroom was oil company lawyers and half the courtroom was scientists. And then they, they started getting into the presentation and presenting the whole history. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is like an episode of law and order, but about climate change. (laughs) And so, and so I thought, Oh, this is it. Like this could actually get people interested in this story, you know? And then I, um, so I started, looking at all of the documents that had been released already and then looking for names in those documents, particularly people that appeared more than once. And then, then like my first step was to look and see who was still alive. Cause a lot of these guys are quite old. Um, and so then I found, you know, I started to find people who were, um, listed on there and still around. And I just started contacting all of these former Exxon scientists to see if they would talk to me. And, um, two of them had talked to press before. And so they were like, you know, a little bit like easier to get to and two had like had not talked to press. And that was, um, Moral Cohen and Marty Hofer. Moral was a scientist and Marty was a professor at NYU who consulted for Exxon. And I really wanted to talk to him because he had consulted for them from like the late seventies, early eighties, all the way up to 2000. So he was really there like during this whole shift. Um, and he, and also because he was close, like working closely with them, but had not been an Exxon employee, I thought he might be a little bit like more open, um, to discussing something. Maybe less loyal to the company. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And less, maybe less worried that they would come after him and, you know, things like that. So, um, so yeah. And he was, I mean, he, he, um, I think he says in the last episode that, you know, they were, he left, he stopped consulting for them because, um, he had an argument with them about what they were doing on the, uh, in terms of seeding climate denial that they were, um, you know, paying 
these scientists who he he was he was he was mostly mad that the scientists they were paying and this is like such a scientist thing to be mad about right like he was mad that these other scientists were like not as legitimate as he was you know mm. <laughs> he was like they don't even have like peer reviewed papers and like they don't have good credentials and like this is embarrassing you know yeah and... <laughs> it sounds sounds familiar <laughs> right yeah and so um so yeah he um and you know he has i think a lot of these guys just have a lot of regret too that they weren't able to convince the company to continue down this other path you know because he's kind of like if they had listened to me like yeah we would have like the exxon gigafactory and the exxon solar boom and you know like everything would be great right um so yeah I, it's a difficult um, position for many of them to be in because you know the yeah. fossil fuel companies provide a source of stable funding for the research yeah. you know things that every researcher wants a freedom to sort of explore the things that you would that you would like to do and a genuine chance at influencing what they might be doing in in terms of their yeah. policy so yeah. i can see why people would stay and stay and consult even as they yeah. had sort of moral I mean, concerns about what was going on totally that comes up in um in one of the episodes, like we looked at the um, amount of funding of research that they do, because I, I, like what happened in the early 2000s was like a lot of that money that they were putting into internal research in the 70s and 80s, they started to put into these um, university research centers, right? And on the one hand, you could say like, well, they should be the ones that are funding research into alternative energy and, and solutions and whatever. But on the other hand, the amount of money that they're putting into these centers gives them an enormous amount of influence over what gets researched and in very like subtle ways. So this is the other thing that I think um, makes this story kind of hard to tell to the public sometimes is that it's not like this, you know, slick oil exec who's like coming in and telling everyone that they can only research, you know, um, new ways to drill for oil or whatever. Right. <laughs> like They are investing in solar, you know, but it's like, They'll, they'll do things like um, have a preference for projects that are much further down the road, right? So it's like technologies that are a lot farther out and therefore like won't impact them as soon, you know? And so they're kind of like, we're interested in it, but only when all of our fossil fuel reserves are, are tapped, you know? Um, I think like one of the, the things that we're going to do next year is look at the impact on the specific towns that these companies have set up shop in. So there's like a town in, in California that is, um, it's basically like a Chevron company town. Um, and, and Chevron has like, it, it almost pays for like the town's police force, for example. And on the one hand you could say, well, they should be a responsible community member and they should be like helping to pay to support the infrastructure of the town. Right. But on the other hand, it makes it very hard for that town to um, hold them responsible for anything because, you know, they threat, they basically threaten to leave town every time any kind of issue comes up. <laughs> so... And politically, whoever represents that state or that uh, district will have to deal with the fact that Chevron yes. wields a lot of influence over the people who live there. This has happened in California for as much as much as the governor of California has done to try to push forward climate policy. He's still very much beholden to fossil fuel interests because they are a huge part of the economy in California. And so he's like come up against a lot of um, criticism from climate activists for um, just being a little bit too friendly with the fossil fuel companies. But then again, like you get like on the other hand, what are we going to do? Like shut these companies down entirely or like, you know, which some people would say yes. <laughs> you know, so um, finding these kinds of love, inclusive solutions are, I don't know, it's, it's tough. And I do think like, I, I mean, I don't know, I do think we're kind of at the point where companies are going to have to be told to do a lot of things that they don't want to do. Um, if, if like, you know, the public's sort of survival is of interest to politicians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, well, we'll we'll see whether that's the case or not. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's interesting, just as a sort of side note on what you were saying about the research that companies 
uh, focus on and promote, mm-hmm. uh, even though it can be green, can be green in a particular way. And one thing yeah. that I think is interesting about this is I'm sure everyone has, uh, who uses Twitter, who listens to this, which is probably most of you, um, mm-hmm. will know that ExxonMobil has done an awful lot of advertising on Twitter for their yeah. unexpected energy Al- campaign for algae biofuels. Mm-hmm. And yeah. now algal biofuels are very interesting because algae yeah. can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and mm-hmm. it can be a negative emission. And it's certainly a, a line of research that's very worth looking into. But at the same time, of course, if you have biofuels, that means you're still using internal combustion engines of some sort. And if you have yeah. uh, technologies that you can say suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, you're saying at the same time, well, we can it's keep okay emitting it. it. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, also, that's another one of those tech, like those those things that, you know, that's been I mean, I wrote a story more than 10 years ago now about the potential of algal biofuels and people were saying then that they could be 10 years out if only the oil companies would put money into them. Um, you know, yes, now, it's a question of whether they're putting more money into advertising what they're doing than than doing it. Right. And that's what I mean and that's what I've heard from a few people is that, you know, despite the massive advertising campaign, like if you look at the actual balance sheet and what they're spending on that versus all the other things, it's, you know, maybe 1% of what they're doing, but it's like 100% of what they're advertising. Um, and and that's another thing, too, is that I'm, I think <clears throat> I have a lot of friends who are climate reporters at big newspapers and things like that. And I think everyone wants to believe that the fact that their newspapers are taking these massive advertorial buys from Exxon have no influence at all on their climate coverage. And that is a fantasy. (laughs) You know, it's just not possible. And there again, it's not, it's not a case of like, you know, some oil company executive, like calling up an editor and killing a story. It's just like, you know, this sort of very subtle influence. And and you see that in their own internal report backs on these campaigns. Like one of the things that they measure, in fact, the key thing that they measure is not how many people is this ad reaching. It's has this ad managed to shift the coverage that the rest of the paper is doing on our industry and on climate. That's what they're focused on. So to think that, you know, um, that these ad buys and, and whatever, like don't have any impact on, on how the subject gets covered is just, I think, kind of magical thinking. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because you're right to say that we should be uh, careful in pointing out that a lot of what is done is subtle and it is well researched because people mm-hmm. have spent kind of decades developing this strategy. You know, it's yes. not necessarily going to be a case of yeah. <laughs> some I mean, oil executive in a top cool. hat. <laughs> shouting yeah, at people um, invented the advertorial um mm. so like they really know how these things work and like they've been doing it since this since you know the late 70s early 80s so you mentioned that uh, part of the inspiration for starting drilled was when you were in judge alsop's uh, climate trial and he was getting mm-hmm. his tutorial from the scientists uh, I, w- I wanted to get your perspective as as a reporter what how do you view the sort of climate legal battles that are going on and do you think it's a a new development that will perhaps enable future reporting like drilled to happen if things like discovery can be opened up for these climate companies yeah i mean that's a big part i think that's a big part of the drive for these um cases actually is like to try to get to discovery so they can get more of this documentation (laughs) um And I do think, I mean, there's been, so there was kind of a batch of these cases maybe 10 years ago, and they all kind of got kicked out once they hit federal court, because the idea was that, that there are federal laws that um, sort of preempt um, any kind of specific local damage on these things. And that also like regulating emissions is the purview of the federal government and not any, any, uh, not the courts and all that kind of stuff. And so this batch of cases that we've seen in the past couple of years are all at the state level, um, state and county, and they're all being filed in state court. And the idea there is that um, states do have the ability to uh, kind of hold companies accountable for liability in these cases. And in some states, California, New Jersey, New York, um, they are the laws are quite favorable around liability so the hope is that date um court would 
um, would rule in favor of the plaintiffs. And, you know, eventually, of course, it would get appealed the whole way the U.S. court system works is like it would get appealed and it would eventually end up in most likely the Supreme Court. And we have a very conservative Supreme Court right now. So, you know, who knows what would happen at that point. But along the way, you would um, you would get discovery, which would lead to, you know, who knows what. And you could potentially get um you know, some information out that would make the public sort of finally get behind the idea of, of holding these companies a little bit more accountable. The, there was a new case that just got filed last week that I think um, has, I think is like, this is the, the type of case that I've been waiting to see because I think it will probably have more um, success than some of the others because it's around economic damage. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the uh, the crab fishermen off the west coast in the U.S. are suing the 30 largest fossil fuel companies for um, economic loss related to the warming of the oceans. There's a um, a particular type of of algae that that blooms when the oceans get warmer in the Pacific Ocean, and it releases a neurotoxin called dimoic acid, and when that um, and crabs just absorb it. Um, and so there was a, I think it was 2015, they, they've started to, um, test crabs during, uh, before the season opens to make sure that they're not, that they don't have a, a lethal amount of this neurotoxin in them. And, um, in 2015, they were not able to start the crab season. It, it was delayed by five months, I think. And so they had losses of tens of millions of dollars. There were a lot of, um, you know, any of the fishermen that like that was their first year, the whole way it works is like you have to buy a boat, then you have to get a license. It's a, it's expensive. So if you can't make back that money, they had this whole batch of new fishermen that were basically out of business before they could even start. And so they're, um, it's an organization um, called the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. So PCFFA. <laughs> it's the West Coast largest commercial fishing association. Um, filed this lawsuit, and and they filed it in state court in California, and they claim um, negligence, defective product liability nuisance and failure to warn about the dangers associated with products the fossil fuel companies knew would cause among other things warming of the oceans and atmosphere um so there again i think what's interesting about these cases um that wasn't part or at least not a big part of the prior cases is is the focus on um hiding information or deliberately sowing doubt um so it's, it's it's more provable. Yeah. And it's also that like they, you know, um, there's this whole idea that because what, what happens, what the oil companies always say is, well, you know, you didn't have to use our product. That's kind of their defense. Right. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, but you were doing all these things to make sure that there were no other options. So, um, so it kind of, it kind of, serves to undercut the, um, individual choice argument that they, they tend to push. Um, the other thing, the other thing that they've started to do, and there are like a few of these cases that are active right now is Exxon has started to sue everyone for infringing on their freedom of speech, because apparently that covers their desire to lie about climate science. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, the the, uh, the fraud is freedom of speech argument is an interesting one legally, I'm sure. Once yeah. you've decided yeah. that corporations are people with First Amendment rights, I guess you can take yeah. that to all kinds of strange places. But it'll be, yeah. uh, it's, it's a good yeah. way to get it tied up in the courts, I guess. <laughs> exactly, yeah. In one case, like in California, they've done this very strange sort of, um, they're trying to get they're accusing the lawyers in a few of these cases to be um, committing conspiracy to infringe on their First Amendment rights. And as part of that, they're asking for pre-suit discovery, um, which I don't think they'll get. But uh, but it's an interesting tactic. And I know, actually, so it's like, you know, everyone's kind of looking at what's happening in these cases as like, oh, you know, and, and looking at what, okay, what are the oil companies doing? What are the tactics that they're using that the other side might use too? And, you know, it's just, I don't know. And there's been also some talk about 
um, you know, the comparison to tobacco gets made a lot between the oil companies and the tobacco companies because of the whole, um, you know, suppression of information, disinformation campaigns, a lot of the same tactics. And I mean, even like the same people doing the same things. Um, and so there has been some talk about trying to, you know, whether or not there could be like a racketeering case against the, the oil companies. Um, yes, this was one of the that... details from Drilled that really, that really I had no idea about because I knew already yeah. that there were parallels between the tobacco industries lying about science and calling real science junk science and so on to try and get their mm -hmm. products keeper. I didn't realize that the tobacco industries had been taken down by a RICO suit. Yeah, they were. Isn't that funny? And the woman who ran that, who won that case, is now consulting with all of the attorneys that are bringing these liability cases. So there's some, you know, everyone's kind of watching to see if they're, they're going to go in that direction. But I think that the, the U.S. government kind of has to be on board for, for that kind of case to move forward. And, you know, right now we have a president who, like, says that it's a hoax created by China. So it's it's outrageous. Yes. It's like I wrote a story a while ago about how, um, you know, the oil companies have been like on board with the IPCC for a while now, right? And like they, they all have pages on their websites about climate change and the need to do something about it and whatever. But they did such a good job that their surrogates are continuing their campaigns for them, you know, including in the, the case of the U.S., like the, the president and up until recently, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency. I mean, you know, mm. like... Ugh, it's the yeah. mark of a successful campaign when you no longer need to run it. It just runs itself. It runs itself. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, I think the legal angle is very interesting because it gives these people who have been, uh, you know, climate scientists who've been talking about this since the 70s, since the 80s, since James Hansen in front of Congress for 30, 40 years and issuing increasingly dire warnings. It gives us an additional angle to uh, expose these things to the public in terms of discovery and things like this, but also to see if there's some other way of uh, compelling action or mm -hmm. e even if the fossil fuel companies think that these, uh, the, the kind of damages that they could potentially get sued for are likely in some jurisdictions to go ahead, it will hopefully change behaviour. Um, yeah. But there's a shift in the world as transnational companies are becoming more powerful, richer, and maybe even more unaccountable than democratic governments. And we've already touched on uh, the, the way that politics is changing uh, with uh, populism, nationalism, things like this. Given yeah. that fossil fuel companies have pulled this hoax on people, have muddied the waters around climate change, have mm -hmm. written in secret memos saying our goal is to create a sense of uncertainty and doubt that delays all action and then gone ahead and done it mm -hmm. and done real damage in the course of this thing. Do you see any role for for these corporations and, and the free market and things like this in, in actually fixing the problem? Do you think there's scope for reform and do you see any signs of that perhaps coming on the horizon? Uh, I I don't think that left to their own devices that would happen. Um, I think I I think that and you know this is an unpopular opinion in a lot of circles, but I I think that um, they have they kind of have to be forced and and I think that that is okay. Like that's a key definition of a company, right? Is that they exist for prop for the purpose of generating profits. So it's it's like I don't I don't actually take this stance that like oh like Exxon is evil because they did everything they could to maintain their profits. Like they did what they were allowed to get away with, as any company would, because that is what companies do. You know, <laughs> so so I think like the idea that companies would or even should be altruistic is um, you know. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. It hasn't been set up to work that way. And so, uh, you know, in my mind, it's like, well, you know, if you want, if you want to check on capitalism, then that has to come from outside the company. I mean, that's a, like, that's like, I mean, it's a key problem in the U.S. is that the, the government in most cases serves the interests of corporations before the public, um, you know, it's, I think, a little bit of an extension of the U.S.'s sort of um, devotion to individual success over all else, you know, 
it's sort of um, it's an it's an ongoing problem of, you know, there isn't really anyone who's looking out for the common good. There's been this controversy at Oxford very, very recently because Steve Bannon came here to speak at the Oxford Union in my town. Yes. And Mm -hmm. um, it got me thinking about Steve Bannon and how he became a politically influential figure in 2016, 17. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. he actually did it in this populist way where he was bashing the banks and bashing the corporate takeover and calling Hillary Clinton a corporate shill and so on. And (laughs) while lining his pockets with corporate funds. While lining his pockets with corporate funds. And then the first thing that Trump and the Republicans do when they get in is deregulate and take on, you know, Mm -hmm. Dodd-Frank and stuff like this. And, And remove all barriers to... But it seems interesting that a lot of the people who we currently view as kind of intransigent and like you say there's this idea that uh, climate denial is part of their emotional identity they also have this deep kind of mistrust of uh, Of the growing power of corporations yes yes, and how they influence the government and it's fascinating yeah it it just seems like if if there is a nexus where we can find common ground it would be in something like this and the only part to persuade people on is well, if you say that these corporations have all this influence, how can your solution simultaneously be to deregulate them and let them do whatever they want in the name of profit? Yeah, so we're going to do another season. We are going to kind of have like ongoing coverage of what's happening in this whole realm. So what's happening with these cases, what's happening with um, kind of looking at all of the different uh, obstacles to acting on climate and, and following, you know, what's been, what's going on with those things and how people are trying to overcome those obstacles. And then we're likely going to do another six to eight part, um, sort of investigative series in the middle of the, of the season too. So, um, so yeah, lots, lots more things to come. Excellent. Well, everyone who's listening to this can go and find Drilled wherever you're listening to this podcast right now. And I urge you do, because it's amazing to hear, uh, you know, not only the narrative way that it's constructed and the way that the reporting has been done, but also from many of the actors who you, who, who you interviewed who had first-hand parts in this in this story. I think it, yeah. it, it's, uh, it's a really fascinating piece of investigative journalism and work, and I'd like to, well, thank you for making it. Thank you. Thanks for ha- uh, listening to it. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and finally, Amy, thanks very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was great. Thanks for listening to this episode of Physical Attraction. The podcast Drilled is on Twitter at Critical Freak Pod. That's Critical F-R-E-Q Pod. And you can follow Amy on Twitter at Amy Westervelt. And of course, all of the episodes from the first season of Drilled are available wherever you're listening to this. Google Drilled Podcast and it'll get you there. And it's well worth your time to listen and find out more about it. There might be a short break before the next episode due to family, work commitments over the holidays, but hopefully we'll be back next Friday with a further interview before launching into our programmes for 2019. As ever, you can find us at www.physicspodcast.com with any comments, questions or concerns via the contact form. You can follow us on Twitter at PhysicsPod. If you enjoy the show, why not leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts. You can send us some feedback via the contact form on the website. You can purchase past bonus episodes or subscribe to us on Patreon. Or the best thing you can do, of course, always is to tell others to listen to the show. Until next time, then, take care.